Well, you can hear him also quite well. Okay, well, welcome to the Horasis panel on uh, Asians as Futurists. Uh, my name is Benjamin J. Butler. I'm an f- uh, independent futurist, also futurist advisor for Horasis. Um, I'm joined uh, today by Jay Lee, uh, VP Engineering at Quincus uh, in Singapore. Uh, Lieutenant General Sadir Sharma, uh, Chairman of Mitcat Advisory Services, uh, currently in India. Uh, and uh, Klaus Newman, uh, Senior VP and Head of Global Labs uh, for Labs, SAP, uh, and I believe you're based in uh, China. In China. China, correct. Thank you. Right. Wonderful. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, we had uh, apologies from Bernard Moon, the, the co-founder of Spark Labs, uh, whose flights have been moved around, I think maybe COVID-related. I guess the new <laughs> reality is all of us having to deal with constant uncertainty. Um, but he said that there's a slim chance he, he might jump in mid, um, partway through. Um, so um, the um, uh, I always... I, I guess being a futurist, I always end up with panels with um, um, a, a very, very large mandate for a very short uh, bit of time. Um, so um, I guess I want to jump in and ask everyone for sort of opening thoughts and remarks on, uh, I guess, Asians as futurists or Asia. Is Asia the future or where is, um, you know, what, what, um, where, where is I guess Asia driving the future. Uh, and of course, um, we've had uh, this global pandemic and um, already, I guess, midway through the last decade um, uh, in terms of GDP, uh, Asia probably became um, the, the largest block uh, on the planet. And many commentators would say the <coughs> pandemic has accelerated a lot of existing trends. Um so would love perhaps um uh Sadir, if you if you don't mind uh kicking us off um uh, what are your thoughts on asia uh, as 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 the future uh thank you benjamin thank you very much uh firstly i'm very optimistic about asia i feel that we are on the right path to grow in the future uh in fact it was supposed to be asia's century and got a bit delayed because of this roadblock of covid but I feel that Asia as a, a continent, I think, has got more strengthened post the COVID. Why I say this is because Asia was blessed and felt very secure under the globalization umbrella. And once it unraveled and it's found that the multilateral organizations, the world bodies were not as, you know, what they are thought about and they were absent on the scene. So certain uh, practices developed within Asia and the decoupling we start taking place when lots of people. I think Asia's uh, global economy started a new architecture. And I now notice that we were all looking at a U-shaped recovery, but I see a V-shaped recovery taking place in Asia. And because of that, the whole global supply chain is being reconfigured uh, positively towards Asia. So I think as we look to the future, I find that Asia is going to get its place back and is going to get forward and go much beyond because the spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship which drives the Asians and the desire to do well is now accelerating on the back of technology because now they are, they are the people who, who pick up technology very quickly and therefore, therefore I feel that they are going much more rapidly now. Uh, my concerns are about on the strategic front. I find that a strategic uh, overhang of, you know, a little bit of fragility is what is creating certain caution in my mind because uh, besides growing economically, Asia has also become the fulcrum of the uh, all powers, you know, fighting for it. You know, the uh, Asia, America and China, India, all the people are also become center stage, the Asia Pacific or the Pacific region. That is the area which of course is a concern because if there is no stability, uh, the growth seems to taper off. And the investments seem to taper off. And it needs a lot of financial investments for it to become what it should be in the future. So to that extent, the strategic weakness of the region, based on the tension which are building up and becoming, a, you know, is what causes me concern about the money coming to it. And finally, a climate change 
uh, which is concern of everybody and COP26, which I believe, Benjamin, you were there too. I hope that the climate change, uh, uh, you know, promises that have been made by all the people are kept and we are able to sail through or able to survive the climate change crisis because Asia, again, um, the way it is uh, lying geographically, is very fragile and very uh, risky about the climate change. You know, the monsoons and the floods and the typhoons which are coming through affect Asia quite a lot. So we hope that they are able to manage that. With those opening remarks in mind, once again, I say I'm very optimistic. I see Asia doing very well. I see innovation growing very well. And I see it developing quite fast. Benjamin? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jay, Jay um, would you like to... Um Go next, particularly focusing on the on, on Asia's um, leadership, um, and we'll, we'll certainly circle back and, and talk about the the concerns and um, and risks. Sure thing. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. So I, I believe we have to be a bit analytical to predict the future by looking at the past, and I think it's somewhat true that the relative cheaper labor cost in Asia has been a deciding factor for Asian workforce workforce to be. A um, bit attractive in comparison to the Western Hemisphere, and it is almost still true in comparison. Um, and due to this, I think the economic growth has been led by consumerism uh, naturally, and it also drives the interest for the willingness of creativity as well. And I believe you can also see the latest success stories of South Koreans' um, K drama or the movie um, Squid Games, or even the K pop group such as BTS. Um, all this, I think, takes part of this willingness of creativity. But I think it is definitely backed by the consumerism in terms of the economic growth. And due to this, I think even with technology, the demand is there. Therefore, uh, I think the whether it's a startup ecosystem or within the corporate uh, nature, uh, because the demand is there, we have to supply the demand with a certain infrastructure and services, such as the even ever-growing growth of cloud computing. And the pandemic, in a way, has also positively impacted the necessity of distributed workforce, but also working remotely. And I think Asia has been one of the best places to test this, but also to grow this um, with taking everything to its advantage. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's interesting you bring up Squid Games. Um, I, I remember reading uh, Parag Karma's uh, very good book, um, The Future is Asia or Asian, a few years ago. And he, he was talking about how... Um, um, you know the the I guess the presence of Asian uh, technology and, and corporates was has been felt in the West for some time, but the the soft power uh, and cultural power of Asia would likely grow over the coming years. And um, I, I I I wasn't going to watch Squid Games initially, um, but uh, I actually ended up watching it, and I, I thought it was actually very very creative. So it was wonderful to see. Um, what what um what what are your thoughts, uh, Klaus? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Benjamin. And uh, as you see, meanwhile, we also get the technology fixed here, <laughs> which is good. Um, and it fits well to the topic. And uh, first of all, thanks thanks for having me on this panel. And uh, sitting here in Shanghai, right? I mean, I just um, got here the uh, this more new uh, green travel code. Uh, we have three COVID cases in Shanghai since yesterday, and now behind the cities I have visited, Beijing is there, and then there's also now Shanghai is a little star, right? And that star now says, okay, this person has been in a city of medium risk, right? So that is the information for, let's say, certain venues you want to enter outside of Shanghai, of course, or uh, in, in other cities across the country. So technology really took a real push forward in terms of uh, controlling the pandemic here in China. And, and uh, the success, the, which is undoubtedly there here in, in controlling the spread of the virus, has to a certain extent, I would even say to a large extent, also to do with the immense uh, application of technology, right? And specifically in, in contact tracing. tracing yeah? the, the government announced yesterday for these three new cases they were able to trace down and test already 10,000 people uh, in direct and further on contact. People who have, were sitting with these people in the same train, in the same subway, and, <laughs> and so on. So this goes in, in lightning speed. 
Um, and I think that is certainly something uh, where we see also that technology uh, supports that, of course, your cause of, of which is important. Yeah? That being said, um, uh, I indeed believe that the, the future in Asia is, is, is digital and um, it, in Asia will also be the locomotive, so to say, I think of a lot of developments going forward. Why? Um, I think uh, Sudhir mentioned it also. If we, if we think about um, um, somewhere in that range, yeah. Uh, obviously, if we if we are not able to create the future here in these countries, also India is such a country, but also many of the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, the, the globe cannot develop further, right? And this is uh, therefore also, I think, at the forefront here of the societies. Uh, and and um, therefore, there is a constant, not only push, but also acceptance then for new technologies in, in that uh, respect. Do, do, do you think um, um, there's, um, so it seems to me there's a very strong cultural dimension to the uptake an adoption of technologies in in Asia. When I when I lived in Japan, um, the I guess the the Japanese approach to robots uh, was totally different from uh, the literature you would see in the UK. You know, with the I guess the 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 cultural legacy of sci-fi science fiction uh, like Frankenstein and uh, and the like. Uh, whereas uh, uh, I guess Jay in Korea as well. I was always um, uh, quite frankly, mind blown by the by the adoption uh, of technologies in 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 Korea. Actually, much quicker than often than in in the US. Um, but does the pa panel think there's a very strong cultural uh, dimension to it, um, or is it a case of civil concern with civil liberties? Uh, maybe I I start. I mean, my experience. Uh, I have been living in China now 10 years and before in India, uh, I also lived there for 12 years, is of course that there's a huge uh, willingness to, to adopt, to try new technologies. And uh, probably uh, in, in China, due to the, the massive availability also, let's say, of smartphones for consumer, there's much more also happening here. And um, therefore, I believe indeed there is a cultural <coughs> element to this that works, if we think about future adoption of, of new technologies, works in the favor of Asia overall, at least for most nations and cultures mm -hmm. I have experienced. And, and I have not been now in all the countries as a citizen, but at least uh, also being around in, in most Asian countries. Mm -hmm. well, um, even if I may button here, um, I, I feel that uh, in India per se, or even in Asia, uh, more than cultural, I feel economic uh, criteria is the one which may restrict certain adoption of technology. We must agree that, you know, adoption of technology is uneven uh, in most of the world, even in Asia or even in India, uh, depending upon what part of the world you belong to. And that is because, firstly, of economic reasons. And culturally, I think uh, in places like India and rest of the Asia, I think everybody is very keen to adopt technology which will better their quality of life, whether it is the, for the family or they can grow better or they can grow you know, richer or corporates adopted because of business reasons and all. But there is a, there is a certain race to uh, adopt technology. I give an example. In, in India this year, in November till November uh, yesterday, there were 40 unicorns created in one year, which means a billion dollars and more <clears throat> in investment. Last year we had 32. So today we have 80 unicorns in India in the last two years, which is quadrupled in the, from the last five years. So the, the quantum jump taking place and all the unicorns that I noticed, 80% of them on the, are riding on the back of new technologies. You know, All of them are e-commerce or e or digital, like uh, Klaus said. they adopting digital technologies to create these unicorns and the people are putting money into it. So I feel that uh, adoption of technologies by Asia per se and countries like India, China, uh, is going to be a lot driven by economic factors that need to grow with. And I think as we move towards the richer and richer Asia, uh, the technology adoption is going to increase rapidly. Uh, that is my feeling, and I hope that continues with it. 
We'll come back uh, to the cyber part of it later on, Benjamin. But this is what my take is. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, th- any thoughts, Jay? Uh, yes, if I may add maybe a few more words to this. Uh, I would like to t- take an example of South Korea and Japan. When you look at Japan since the 80s and up until the 90s, uh, there was very hyper growth. And the, I think the growth was led by adoption of technology and the Western culture and everything was further developed. Whereas in Korea, even through the 80 Olympics, I don't think it was anywhere near comparison to Japan. But if you look at Japan and Korea today, uh, not to say that this, this side has switched in terms of who is more further developed, but I think focus has been different. I think what led really Japan back in the 80s and 90s for growth was really leveraging the cultural aspect of obedience. So as a South Korean native, I believe South Korean people are less obedient than Japanese, culturally speaking. Mm -hmm. And that was actually very beneficial to grow such as manufacturing kind of development or economic growth. Whereas in today, um, the culture and the society of South Korea being less obedient from Jay's point of view, I think drives this tactical mindset that we have to come up with something new, something that is attractive, that is out of the box, which could be a little bit different in terms of the willingness of creativity that comes from Scandinavian countries in terms of design firms. So I believe that's a different category. But the creative willingness, I think, also comes from the society where people are kind of less obedient than the next door neighbors as Japan. And maybe today, South Korea as one of the growing economies are benefiting from this kind of cultural aspect. Yeah, so creativity is a um, thanks for those words. Um, I, I was going to uh, do a round on what what technologies do, do you think will be the the drivers for for Asia over the coming uh, over the coming decades? Um, I, I've been involved in a number of organisations, and I sat on a council for the quantum computing once, and um, I'm far from an expert, but I was um, <coughs> oh, quite incredulous that. The, the Chinese had made so many uh, breakthroughs on such a an important te- technology, um, and, and of course, AI and and some other fourth or, or technologies of the fourth, fifth industrial revolution, or where, wherever we are now. Um, um, but that also feeds into what you just said about creativity. There, there used to be a um, an idea that um, Asia wasn't creative, that that um, in many ways, it was catching up with the West, and uh, I, I completely beg to, to differ uh, on that. I, I think uh, all human beings are actually innately uh, creative. Uh, it just depends what structures you you and what kind of education you put into place. So, uh, another uh, very open ended uh, question, but I guess the t- the topic is um, um, the technologies you see of the future and and. Um, any thoughts you might have about creativity? Um, uh, Klaus, would you like to uh, kick off? Happy happy to kick off. Thank you. Um, I mean, we have um, for our firm here, right, uh, several thousands of engineers who work here on uh, technology. And, and uh, so therefore, there's no doubt that I also personally, of course, believe very strongly in the creativity uh, of Asians and specifically in this case here of, of Chinese, but we have actually even more thousands of people in India and uh, also labs in Japan um, and Korea. Yeah, so uh, and 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 that is probably also uh, to to echo what what um, Jay said, right? Uh, creativity exposes itself in in different forms depending on the culture, and and what we try is really to to capture the best, so to say, uh, of each culture and in the merging of that, create a new level then of, of innovation. Yeah, That just by doing something in just one cultural context probably wouldn't be so successful or also not so relevant then for the rest of the world. Yeah? Because uh, I mean, why, why did we go out in the first place? We, we were a world <coughs> leading company by having most of our engineering like 20 years ago in Germany. Uh, but then it appeared also to all of us back then, hey, that can't be everything, right? I mean, uh, it cannot be that the future of the whole world in terms of how businesses run lies with an engineering, um, let's say, 
intelligence uh, in southern Germany. Uh, and it was also pretty clear that we can't get the best talents from around the globe to one single place. So let's go out there. And therefore, um, I'm a strong believer in, in the diversity of creativity and differences, how people think and also come to solutions, right? Like my experience in India was always, there is always a solution to everything. And often people try things out, right? And, and by that also getting into the next step, right? Uh, in, in other countries here, it's more like, let's think it first through, right? And, and start maybe a little later, yeah? And then, but you have maybe then a, a higher passion, right? Or what, what Jay said, right, in terms of obedience to what is being told by someone, right? Or whether it's my professor or whether it's the government, right? So all of these things are different. And, and if you, if you develop that skill to bring it together, that's the best you can do. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sadir, do you have any, uh, yeah, uh, I have got a few thoughts in my mind. Uh, firstly, I will agree with uh, Jay and Clay that creativity grows in an environment in which you are in. Uh, for example, when he gave the example of Japan adopting technologies and Korea adopting technologies, lots of technologies in Germany and these places were, were developed because of uh, reducing the man load. You know, they wanted to create robotics or manufacturing, automated all the processes in the factories where the uh, people were less and they wanted to create a uh, situation where they could do so. And that spurred a lot of technologies. And in India, uh, because of the availability of young population in large numbers, the creativity did not move towards that direction, but moved in a different direction altogether. And that created a different kind of, you know, ecosystem in India. And that's how creativity build up. As far as technology is concerned, I, I noticed that in India, a lot of emphasis is being given on artificial intelligence is one part. And uh, I think that's going to be one of the driving forces of Indian economy and Indian growth in the next five years, as we move towards a $5 trillion economy, AI is going to play a big role in creating uh, this thing. Second thing which I notice is that energy transition, countries like India, China, Japan, which are dependent upon still fossil fuels and other things to create energy, are doing a lot of technological innovations in you know creating a rules to go to energy transition and going more and more to a renewable energy and where we can meet the UNDP's uh, climate change goals, plus create for self -centration. So technology towards battery storage, electric vehicles, and that is again driving India forward. And I think next few years, energy transition is going to be another area where we're going to be working on. And finally, uh, work has started already on climate change, how to create technology in India so we're able to meet the carbon neutral goal. So that innovations and things are already start building up. I hope it will pick up momentum besides quantum computing and all these things. And therefore, I see in Asia, uh, early adoption of lots of technologies this time, as compared, like I said, to the West, where we used to, you know, follow all the time. This time, I think we may be leaders in some of the technologies, at least, and I'll start trying to catch up with them. That's my hope, and that's my prediction. Mm, thank, thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Jay. Uh, yes, Benjamin. I think there are two different parties here that I feel that would drive the techn technology innovation and the demand. One is on the governance side, the other is in the private sector. I think the private sector is pretty obvious with remote work and distribution workforce, um, the need to work smarter, uh, to be able to be effective and efficient, um, to overcome maybe the trust factor because we're not physically within proximity anymore. So I think that's the obvious growth in terms of um, the, the labor force being able to enable itself with this new pandemic, even post pandemic wise as well. But I think there's a second category, which is smarter governance which come from policymakers or governments. Now, I will personally hope that these two parallel will be aligned to the same direction so it doesn't contradict. Um, going back to an earlier point, because if the government's led or policy-led technology is trying to not just be smarter in terms of monitoring and analyzing to make more effective policies, but if it's more stewarded towards to um, more obedience in terms of governance, I think that interest could be a bit contradicting with the private sector wanting to equip itself with more thinking out of the box or going beyond or bending the rules. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Interesting. You know, my, um, I, I, I very much believe in, in looking at um, aggregate data and empirical evidence, but um, uh, sometimes anecdotes are very powerful. And um, 
I, I, I became very concerned. I mean, I'm a, a global citizen first and foremost, but I, I came, became quite concerned about the prospects for uh, Western Europe and the USA when I, I saw a survey of what um, teenagers wanted to become when they uh, graduated. And I think it was young teenagers. And um, in, um, in China, the, the number one career was uh, to become an astronaut. Uh, uh, unfortunately, in the UK or the USA, the number one uh, aspiration was to become a social media influencer. <laughs> and at that point, I thought, oh, oh dear, um, I'm not sure um, whether we're going to drive the next uh, round of, um, uh, of technologies. Um, I, um, I was going to ask, but before we dip into risks to, 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 to Asia going forwards, um, I was wondering whether whether you discerned any uh, shift in governance of or, uh, of corporations themselves. Um, so, um, a, f a few years ago, we started to see literature, management literature, promoting uh, self organizing systems. Um, there was a, a book by uh, a an ex uh, McKinsey consultant from Europe called uh, Reinventing Organizations, um, Frederick Laloux. And um, th there's been a lot of discussion about uh, bringing power, uh, decentralizing power in organizations and um, uh, more sort of bottom up um, power, autonomy, responsibility. And um, it it seems to have taken off to a certain extent in Europe and, and the US. Um, is this? Do you think this will be a trend in in Asia as well? And and could this um, be conducive to a more creative environment? Uh, I don't know, Carl. Did whether you want to kick off? Uh, yeah, Benjamin. Thanks. I, I believe there are two aspects to this, right? I mean, uh, one is just decentralizing uh, boardroom decisions, so to say, uh, and, and uh, giving more empowerment in general to the next line and the second line and so on, uh, and encouraging also bottom-up initiatives. And I believe most companies I'm aware of uh, trying to do this, with, with some with more, others with less, success or what I also have seen in, in, in public in a presentation some time ago from, from higher here in China, uh, at trying to adopt this, this uh, re reverse pyramid model, right? I think also a famous Harvard model, uh, thinking from the customer first and, and, uh, and uh, not actually from the first. Yeah? And so there are also in, in Asia, I think a couple of companies that, that try to rethink the way they lead their organizations. Um, there seems to be still, um, how can I say, invisible barriers when it comes to uh, people outside of the headquarter, right? So you may be able to distribute power somewhere in your headquarter, but the moment people are in a different continent, uh, way too often they are just asked to execute certain things, right? To execute pieces of strategy or to, to uh, engineer something that somebody else has thought through and so on. And um, that is still um, a field where also, of course, organizations try to get more participation. But does it really reflect in all levels it's it's not the I would say it's not the standard case yet definitely not yeah so so um, and I think here uh, we have still a long way to go with this higher participation in countries outside of your own headquarter and I see this in Asian companies but I see this also in European co uh, companies uh, with Asian participation on the top level decisions. Mm, yeah, thank you, thank you, J Jay. Do you have any um, thoughts? Because when we chatted yesterday. You we we got on to the topic of decentralization. Uh, yes, I mean, this is definitely an interesting topic. Um, so to use an example of my current organization, I currently serve an engineering team that's scattered across eight different countries, from Oslo, Norway, all the way to uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Uh, and the engineers themselves actually really strive to keep this very diverse culture, but also task force. 
even if it brings us the burden of different time zone and having to rely on asynchronous communication because it's it becomes very challenging to have like a on demand real time <laughs> communication when we're distributed so diverse and so uh, broadly. If I were to address this back to your question, uh, I think it really comes down to maybe the cliche statement of culture would eat strategy for lunch, for example. Uh, no matter what strategy we have and no matter how much we enable ourselves with technology, if the bottom line of each organization or if it's even a government does not really steward something that is more culture driven rather than being transactional, I, I, I think there will always be a cap. There will be a limit because at the end of the day, we're human beings. We have free will. We would have to make our decisions and have to have buy-ins and alignment in terms of the thought process. I think that takes a lot more effort than just some kind of infrastructure or technology that is in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And I'm definitely a proponent that culture drives uh, everything. Um, so, Sadir, I, I would, um, um, given the interest of time and you being um, a resident um, expert on military <laughs> scenarios, um, please, by all means, please comment on the last question. But I, I was actually going to ask uh, ask you. Um, we, we discussed some of the risks for Asia yesterday on um, in in our call, um, and um, geopolitical would seem to be one of the largest risks out there. Um, and um, I think it surprised a lot of people in the business community when this sort of nascent Cold War or rift between uh, China and the USA em emerged, um, I guess, when uh, Trump became president. Um, how, how serious is it? Uh, and um, what um, I'm sure internally you do a lot of scenario analysis and even assign probabilities to certain events. <clears throat> um, it seems that the world is now getting quite concerned about Taiwan. Um, and, and any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, firstly, I would like to say that uh, purely from a risk matrix, uh, the last few years, the risk has increased from the past few years. I would say that if you compare it from the pre-pandemic and the Trump era, Biden era, uh, the risks have increased. That is because the, the uh, friction and the uh, competition between America and China has also increased. You know, uh, The decoupling, which we thought will take place slowly, seems to be moving in a good direction. And the, the way things broke up between Australia and China, uh, that aggravated the situation in the Western world. And therefore, Asia and Indo-Pacific became the battleground between the two superpowers now. And we see that Taiwan uh, every day becoming more and more in the news and uh, the tensions are rising. And I see it happening all over the place within Philippines. India and China have already had a border skirmish of a very, fairly serious nature. We are engaged in negotiation with them on the border, and that is not going as well as we expected. China is a little more, uh, I would use the word aggressive, but getting a little more upset with the way it is being cornered by the rest of the world possibly, and therefore it's becoming more and more muscular in its approach to its issues. And therefore it leaves most of the Asian countries in a dilemma, uh, because stage is reaching where they are not required to choose, or at least make their options known that who is the friend who is not the foe. The ASEAN countries have for very long have been very, very keen not to take sides with America or China in a dispute. But the way America goes about it, the way things are happening in the Quad and now in the AUKUS, uh, it seems that, you know, some countries have to start taking side. I'll give you an example of India itself. Till three to four years back, India was treating the Quad as some kind of a thing which they wanted to enter tipping their, you know, toe in the water, but not very enthusiastic about it. You know, you know, reluctant groom, so to speak, in the grouping. In the last year, I've noticed with the heads of state meeting of the Quad, India has got more deeply involved in the Quad and is now getting more and more involved, as is Japan. So therefore, there has been a shift, I think, in the last two years in the uh, tension and in the polarization between the uh, two powers. And that is something which is of concern to me. And therefore, I would say geopolitically, Asia as a region is now more prone to risk than it was a few years back. And unless some good sense prevails and we are to arrest it, things are continuing to go slightly away because of the Taiwan issue, 
because of the South China Sea issue, because of the India China the way it is, and the economic battle which is taking place for domination of the markets and for the space. All this is building up over a period of time. And Russia is also feeling cornered. You've seen what's happening in Ukraine. So therefore, I see a period of fragility is taking place and we need some time off to try and settle this down so that uh, things start going back to normal. Without, without a security umbrella, there is no growth. Once that happens, the growth stops, the investment stop, the technology transfer stops, and we need that for Asia to go in the future. So to me, geopolitical risk is right up there in the matrix uh, in the, and continue to grow. Mm. Would you, um, do you have any probability of serious conflict in the next 10 years? Uh, if I were to hazard a guess, my probability would be yes. It, I, would, I would put it rated as 6 out of 10 uh, probability uh, of some skirmish taking place, but I still hope that you know very people are very sensible enough that because the risk is too high. You know the stakes are too high for anybody to take this gamble. But things are building up a bit. You know, so many incursions taking place today that every day you see one dozen planes, twenty planes, thirty planes, ships moving around the streets, and uh, this 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 jockeying for power is taking place, and nobody's blinking at the moment. And we hope the world body can help them stop this blink. And uh, otherwise, I see a probability of. Uh, some kind of a uh, war taking place in the region in the next few years. Yes, my mm. number is about six plus six out of ten. Mm. I tend to concur and have believed for some time that that China would actually take t- Taiwan uh, uh, before Xi Jinping leaves office. But um, uh, before I pontificate my my thoughts, um, I'm sure the audience would love to hear. Um, Klaus and Jay's thoughts on risks for the region. Um, um, do, do, what, what risks do you uh, perceive, um, Klaus? Do, do, would you like to kick off? I mean, it could, could be economic, geopolitical. What, from your vantage point and, and being in Shanghai? I, mean, I would say we, we still face a very significant uh, environmental risk, right? Uh, whether it's a dramatic uh, issue with air pollution in, in key cities of Asia. Um, India, I think, has the, I would say, uh, not so nice uh, position right now to probably have five out of the ten most air polluted cities in the region. Um, China usually had these uh, um, um, honors, so to say, but uh, did a lot, one has to say. Uh, so it is solvable uh, to some extent, which is a good sign, but it needs continuous, of course, uh, focus. Yeah. Um, we have water issues in, in many, um, yeah, also big cities in Asia uh, that may run out of water and so on. And I think these fundamental uh, challenges need solutions and just some digital uh, better distribution systems won't make it, right? It needs really society, governments, and everyone to work together. Uh, and the second is, of course, also the trend to urbanization um, that is also putting, of course, many, many cities uh, under enormous constraints in Asia. Uh, I think China is here again um, managing it, right, with this, a very strict residence permit um, system called the HUKO system. But in other areas of Asia, this is not possible uh, to do it that way. And, and therefore, again, um, we have to deal with those mega trends in order to be able to uh, reduce the risks. I mean, Sudia is certainly the expert on that whole um, geopolitical risk, so I, I wouldn't add to this. Uh, although, of course, I have my own concerns also what's going on in the region. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Jay, what do you perceive the largest risks as? So, Benjamin, I believe it has to do with data. As data has become very important, an essential piece of any business growth, um, regardless of the geographic location. I do believe the sensitivity of the data and the security of the data is um, ever more important. Um, and these are not just emphasizing on the data breaches that happen occasionally every year from corporates. Uh, I think this would apply to even our daily lives in the near future because, as I've mentioned before, with e-governments or decentralized governments or empowering policies to more um, technology-driven governance methods through technology, uh, I think these information that gets collected as data uh, can be very powerful, but 
how do we secure these data? How do we utilize these data without abusing these? I think will be uh, potentially a risk factor. Yes, mm -hmm. certainly. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, well, uh, we have a just four, four or five minutes uh, left, um, and um, it's always challenging on these panels. Uh, we, we have such, such depth of knowledge here, and um, only a short um, moment of time. Um, but maybe if, if you'd like to reflect on anything that's been said and make any concluding um, re remarks, um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll um, invite you, Sadir, first. Um, uh, and, and I know yeah. you, um, to Jay's point, you were talking to me yesterday about yes. cyber security. Yeah, I would like to uh, you know, add that. You know, firstly, uh, you know, we look at Asia as you know, three distinct parts, you know, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia. They all seem to be three different territories behaving in a slightly different matter from geopolitic angle. But to take on Jay's point, to me, one of the big concern is the cyber security. You know, I feel still that the Asian economies or the Asian governance systems are still not robust enough. They don't have enough protection against cyber, I would say, threats or a cyber meltdown can take place anytime. What you talked about data privacy and data management. I, as we grow more and more digital and IoT builds up, I see it is a big risk and um, lots of small nations could be at the mercy of somebody who's better at, you know, getting to it. So to me, that's an area of major concern that unless we're able to solve the cyber story, we go forward, we need to spend a lot of money, a lot of technology to create data security and cyber security on the area. And finally, ecological. I mean, we need to work hard in Asia to ensure that we don't come to an ecological disaster. And that is the third risk, which I feel geopolitical, cyber and ecological risk. These three are going to be a big concern for all we go forward. Thank you. Great. Th thank you. Thank you. But net net, you, you, you say that you're optimistic despite all these challenges. Me? Yes, uh, yes. I, I am yeah. optimistic because I see the resilience of the Asian, you know, for generations, you know, that, that cultural point that he talked about, Jay talked about and Klaus talked about, the culturally the Asians are very resilient people. They seem to, you know, thrive in adversity. So therefore I feel that despite everything which is happening during the pandemic and afterwards, when I go around and see a positive step, everybody seems to feel that they can get out of the dip because they are used to having this. So that gives me a lot of courage, a lot of hope, young population, positive looking, and they have, uh, they're there they to risk anything to do anything. They give me a lot of hope that Asia as a future is secure because of the resilience of the people of uh, Asia culturally. They need to, they will survive. Yeah, yeah, I, I um, concur with you on that, that front. Um, Klaus, um, uh, what are your concluding thoughts? Yeah. Um, very briefly, and, and to, to build here on, on Zudia's thought, uh, if I would agree, or I also agree that cybersecurity is, of course, a, a major pro prohibitor, so to say, for, for a continuous innovation, for continuous peaceful innovation specifically, uh, then we should also not forget that the other issue we see for, for economies is an overregulation as a reaction, right? So we create big walls around our own cyber uh, sphere and do not let anyone anymore in and out, right? <laughs> so this is probably uh, then also not um, a status we should wish for uh, because we need a, an open exchange also of data and, and information. It is, I think, very, very important for all the nations here. Um, I also observe and therefore I also i am in principle optimistic uh, that with the with the speed of, of the culture here, with the, with the optimism that, that most people have, we will be able to address the challenges and also find solutions. The, the world always found solutions to these problems, even in darkest years. And I, I'm very optimistic that it was, that will also be the case this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going slightly into extra time. Um, if that's okay for everyone, for Jade to, to finish his um, concluding remarks. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, I'll just briefly go back to our yesterday's discussion about dialogue. And I think it's it's hard to deny how important dialogue is. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's the human race that's behind these technology, these policies, uh, and every single decision that we make in every aspect. Um, and I think we've also discussed today about um, 
the conflicts and the risk factors that um, is with it, with us. And maybe the simplest way to address this is through dialogues, whether it's dialogue through a certain channel or technology, but in the, the day, having these multicultural, uh, going beyond the boundaries dialogue, I think is going to be the, the core essence uh, to empower it for our engagement for the better future, um, rather than depending on the method itself. Uh, that I most certainly concur with. One of my favorite topics is dialogue, um, a word often used by politicians, but not. Uh, but in practice, um, uh, it doesn't it always happen. Um, per- personally, my my biggest risk is the ecological crisis we're, we're all facing, um, f- followed by geopolitics, and, and maybe the geopolitical risk will rear its ugly head. Um, first, but uh, on on a positive note, uh, having just come back from COP twenty six in Glasgow, I'm hoping that that this global crisis that all of humanity is facing will actually bring us together uh, and and not separate us. Um, and and I'm I'm glad that all the panelists mentioned the ecological crisis um, uh, as a uh, an, an important um, consideration for the for the future um well i I'd, I'd love to brainstorm with um the you all much longer but um uh time has run out so um thank you so much uh, for making time today and um i hope to see you again thank you benjamin thank you for conducting it so well and thank you for being in touch with us thank you all thank right you everybody. It was thank a pleasure. you everybody and the audience preeti sam my friends yeah. thank you very much all the best Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy to reconnect. Bye-bye.